how did you become a trainer? Can you talk about that whole genesis of why Gene Monahan became a trainer? Surely. When I was growing up, much like probably 99% of every young uh, boy or girl growing up, I ended up with a passion for something, and, and uh, my passion was baseball. I loved the game. I had a passion for the game. It's, it's I'm 61 years old. It's never left. I was growing up in Fort Lauderdale. The Yankees were having spring training in St. Petersburg up until 1962. In 1962, they moved over to Fort Lauderdale, and the city built them a stadium, a 7,000-seat stadium for spring training, and Mr. Dan Topping Sr. and uh, the Yankee hierarchy came over there at that time and set up shop there. They moved out of St. Petersburg after many years and they were going to host spring training there. And of course, I was very excited. I was not a Yankee fan. I obviously was a Pirate fan because my family was from Pittsburgh and I loved the Pirates. But uh, as it turns out, uh, whenever I could get a chance between school and bagging groceries at the grocery store, I would get on my bike and drive the three miles, four miles, and go over there and watch them work out, play and catch and get fly balls and stuff. And I knew that I really loved the game, and I would do anything to be a part of or somehow approach it uh, at that level, at the professional level, even minor leagues. As it turned out, um, it, it, you know, it really it really became a desire for me and I, I wrote a letter to the general manager of the Fort Lauderdale Yankees uh, that year in 1962. And that was my senior year of high school. The major league team broke camp, went north, and they left a class D ball team. Back then it was A, B, C, D and all that stuff, triple A, double A. And they, they had a class D team in Fort Lauderdale and I, I wrote a letter to ask them if I could be the bat boy. And one thing led to another, and I came over to the game and I interviewed with Mr. Dan Topping Jr. at the time. And uh, he said, you can be the bat boy. Here's two tickets for tonight's game. Go get your dad and come to see us play Washington Senators. You know, I went and got my dad out of church. It was a Monday night service, and uh, we went to the game, and uh, I was the bat boy. The clubhouse man uh, quit early in the summer. It was, he was an old elderly man. He, he, he wasn't adjusting to the young kids and their idiosyncrasies. I was 17. I could do that. And asked me if I wanted to do the clubhouse work. So I did both. Mm -hmm. I mean, between innings, I was doing laundry. I was running back and forth. I loved it. Loved it. And um, after that year, in 62, as bat boy and clubhouse boy, they asked me if I would like to pursue a career in athletic training and, and learn about being a trainer because back in those days minor leagues uh, trainers were the, sometimes a lot of times they drove the bus they did all the laundry they shined the shoes they swept out the clubhouse they kept everybody's phone numbers and addresses together and they just pretty much did everything the budgets were low and I said well I don't know anything about the medical profession I really don't think I have a chance of going up the ladder in that, in, the, in that particular type of thing, but I love this game so much, let me try. And uh, I did, I went to spring training for a couple of years, went to a junior college down there for a little bit, trying to get an education. And then after my double A season in 1965, I realized uh, I loved being an athletic trainer and I would need to get a formal education. And I got some advice and I ended up at Indiana University, got my degree, kept my double A job in the summers, and worked through that. I, was, I spent 10 years in the minor leagues with the Yankees. You've mentioned a number of times your, your love and passion for the game. W where did that come from, and, and were you much of a ball player? I guess that's two questions. Were you much of a baseball player? I love the game. I would play um, just like all the other guys you read about in the, in the magazines that are big leaguers. Uh, I throw the ball against the house to my dad. It would absolutely scream at me. I would knock the stucco off the house in Florida. You know, the house is going to fall down. If you you got to stop doing this. Uh, as I was playing by myself, you know, and I had rubber balls, and you hit the ball, throw the ball against the house, and it's a ground ball, and you practice, 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 practice. And I just, we had a black and white TV, and between racing and the, the Indianapolis 500, which was only on the radio back then, and I'm a racer guy, uh, we'd have to go in the car and listen to it on the radio. But we had Buddy Blattner and Dizzy Dean on the black and white TVs in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And we'd watch them, and 
and I mimic those guys just like everybody else does even today. Yeah. But I, I, I just loved the game, and I, I knew that, that it was more than just something I appreciated and cared about. It was something I really wanted to take part of my, you know, take my life and, and, and go into that with and, and somehow create a relationship where I could, you know, thrive. And uh, I remember a, a, a few guys, minor league directors and that, who have since passed on back in those days say, you keep working and you keep studying and you keep keep your nose clean and work really hard and do all this stuff, you, you, you're going to end up, you know, you, you might end up with a little career in this, you know, you might be okay. Would that 17-year-old kid in Fort Lauderdale ever have imagined he'd be sitting here in Yankee Stadium 30-some years later as the longest tenured head trainer in, in baseball? At the time, no, I didn't think so. I, I, I really didn't. I didn't think so. Um, back then, I didn't. I had hoped and wished and prayed, but I had a lot of other things going on too. But I didn't. I didn't think so then. Uh, I had plenty of opportunities, and well, I had plenty of times in the minor leagues on those buses, where we'd have our little Walkman, you know, and I'd, I'd uh, listen to uh, Waylon Jennings, who I really loved and cherished, and got to know. And he's since passed away, a lot of health problems, and. His music and his songs got me through those cornfields and got me through the Carolinas and got me through uh, upstate New York and all this stuff and and I would listen to the words and I you know there's more out there than just what your dream is but I always tell kids and I always tell groups of kids that if you never give up on your dream no matter how long it takes you to you're dead uh, if you keep working at it and keep you're going to find a way to make it happen. But you got to have the perseverance and the drive and, and the passion. If you don't have the passion, it ain't going to happen. But I was blessed that I, I, was all, I always had a dream. And I'm a dreamer. But I, I'm one of those, Rizzuto once called me a Horatio Alger thing. I don't even know who that guy was or what that means. But if you don't give up and you keep fighting and, and working hard, and you, 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 can make, you can do anything. There's nothing you can't do. I mean, there really, there really isn't. I mean, you can get darn close.